Welcome to The Nation Speaks. I'm your host, Cindy Drew Carey. Today we bring you a special episode from the annual Conservative Political Action Conference this year in Orlando, Florida, the first time since CPAC was founded in 1974. CPAC is historically the barometer for the direction of the conservative movement, and that's especially the case this year. Tomorrow, former President Donald Trump will speak here, his first public speech since leaving office. CPAC always attracts the highest profile conservatives and the rising stars, and we had a chance to sit down with many of them. So here's our special edition from CPAC. I'm here with Senator Mike Lee from Utah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So I listened to the speech that you gave earlier, and you talked a lot about um, faith in government is tyranny and faith in the people is freedom. And I thought that was a really interesting theme. And one of the things that you were talking about, well, one of the things I want to know from you is how do conservatives sort of combat the government worshipers, as you call them? Uh, what tools are in the toolbox that can actually combat the government worshipers? First of all, this is what conservatism is. Conservatism is uh, about looking at the fact that we are different than our government. In other words, when you hear a politician say, uh, you need me, what you should hear is, I need you. A politician can't do anything without the consent of the people. And uh, when you hear a politician say, we've got to get back to running the country, don't stand for that. They don't run the country. They, they, they might have a role in running one part of one government, uh, but they don't run the country. There's a big difference between the country and its government. Most of what our country is and what any country is should always be separate and, and distinct from what its government is. Government's got a narrow role, and when we inflate it in our own minds with our own rhetoric, we do grave injustice to the cause of liberty. So Practically speaking, if there is a government in power that wants more control for the government, more bigger programs, government to spend more, what can conservatives do to combat that? Especially, let's say, you know, the marketplace of ideas. We should, you know, let the best ideas win. What if those ideas are controlled? Censorship, you know, that's become more of an issue. So what can conservatives do? Okay, so my central message from today was assemble. Push back every single time, especially when you see the government starting to intrude on your freedom of assembly. It's one of the least appreciated features of the Bill of Rights and even of the First Amendment itself. It's the least celebrated part of that protection. But the freedom of assembly is upstream from all the others in the sense that none of the other rights are really sustainable if the freedom of the people to assemble is impaired. And so we need to push back relentlessly on government telling you that you can't assemble to worship, that you can't assemble with your friends and your family as you choose. And look, during a pandemic, I understand there might be some need uh, to, uh, to adhere to certain health protocols. We should always encourage those protocols to be embraced by individuals and by organizations of their own free will, not forced upon them by government. That's a third rail, and it's one that we should treat as a third rail. But those freedoms more and more are getting infringed on right now in the name of public health, public safety, and people are going along with it. In the name of emergency. It's always in the name of emergency. This is how it happens. You know, it might take a slightly different form or a different path uh, in one civilization as compared to another. But never did any society move toward either socialism or any other form of uh, uh, overreaching government status without there being an emergency at the heart of it. That's not to say that um, uh, emergencies don't exist or that they shouldn't be taken seriously. It just means that we should pay more attention and be more inclined to scrutinize government action during an emergency, not less. Have you been surprised by how much people generally seem to be willing to go along with their losses of freedom? Yes, yes, I have. Uh, but I've also been encouraged by the fact that they've made clear they're not going to continue to do this because it's gotten absurd. Look, we are a practical people. We, we're willing to, to work for the greater good when there's a common crisis confronting us. But we also understand that we were made to be free. 
When going on a year now, people have, in many cases, been unable to go to church to worship together. Uh, uh, that's a problem. Now, if they want to choose that on their own, that is absolutely their choice. Government should be the last entity that ever gets the chance to do that. In fact, it just shouldn't do it at all, ever. All right, let me change gears ever so slightly and talk about big tech. I know that you're behind uh, a new bill. Um, what, what, you, you've gone, I think, back and forth in your career a bit over how much we should control big tech or break it up. So what's your current position and, and why? Okay, so I, I recently introduced a bill called the Promise Act uh, because we've got to address a couple of tensions within our, our system, a couple of major problems that have erupted as a result of the fact that there's hegemony uh, among a few big tech companies that are themselves suppressing speech. Now remember, it's different when a private company or any private party, any non-government actor suppresses speech. It's different than when government acts. But insofar as they engage in fraudulent activity, deceptive activity in suppressing speech, then we've got a problem. That's what the, where the Promise Act comes in. We've got uh, some online providers of various services, including and especially social media platforms, that have publicly proclaimed over and over again through their CEOs and through their policy statements, uh, look, we're not going to weigh in on matters of politics. We're not going to suppress uh, or advance speech based on uh, its political content. And yet, notwithstanding those promises, directly contrary to them, we've seen them doing the exact opposite of that. I had a big awakening a few months ago when I saw um, after years of Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and Jack Dorsey at Twitter saying we're politically neutral. I saw them take down, suppress, place warnings around, in some cases deplatform, conservative voices. I had a couple of hearings with them, one on the Judiciary Committee, one on the Commerce Committee. I serve on both in the Senate, in which I asked them about these and they, they kind of said, oh, shucks, well, uh, we've got some Democrats mad at us too. It must mean we're doing something right. And I, I, I asked them, okay, can you name a single example of where they, they have treated someone on the left the way they've treated any of the countless examples that we can all rattle off off the top of our head on the conservative end? They couldn't. They didn't. They stumbled, they stammered, but they couldn't name a single corresponding example of what they had done. And that made me realize they're deceiving people. So the Promise Act gives the authority to the Federal Trade Commission to go after companies that do that, promising one thing in their services, offering another. And it gives them the authority under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act to address that kind of fraudulent behavior. And so what would be the redress? Uh, uh, they, they could issue injunctive orders requiring them to comply or face significant consequences, including, for example, fines. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Senator thank Lee. You. So we're here with Katie McFarlane, former Deputy National Security Advisor for the Trump administration. Thanks for joining us. It's a great pleasure and an honor, and it's awesome to see you guys back at CPAC. Excellent. So let me start by asking you this. We, um, Biden administration has been in for a couple of months now, and it looks like it's pretty much, you know, foreign policy back to the way it was. Uh, is it, though? Has Is there any lasting impact of the Trump administration's you know, the way I like to think about it is, think of a three-act play, right? The Trump administration was a revolution. And Trump had very different policies, economic policies, tax policies, trade policies, and very different foreign policies, not just from the Democrats, but from the Republican foreign policy as well. I mean, Trump ran because there was 20 years of foreign policy mishaps and serious ones. It cost American blood and treasure. So he's the revolution. And he smashes, you know, the windows. And he does, well, we all know about President Trump. And then the Biden administration is the counter-revolution. It's all those people from, you know, frankly, both political parties. It's all the Washington establishment. The guys who were getting rich on the good old system. The guys who thought they were the smarty pants. They're so smart. They're coming mm -hmm. back in. They're going to get rid of Trump. Life's going to go back to their blissful ruling of America because they're so much smarter than the rest of us. Well, that's where we are now. And I think the big thing is what happens next. I predict that the Biden administration is going to have just a phenomenally failure for its foreign policy. And then we'll see about Act 3. I think the Trump revolution continues on. In what form? Okay, so here's what's going to happen. <laughs> um, Biden is going to raise taxes, right? He's going to, and he's going to raise regulations again. 
things that Trump got rid of. We're going to crush small business in America, where he's going to um, put so many regulations on fracking that we're no longer going to have cheap oil and natural gas, which also takes a hit on the economy on manufacturing. It also means American gasoline, you know, what is it now, two fifty a gallon? <laughs> Think about five, six dollars a gallon. What's that do to the economy? And, and then because we're no longer energy independent, we're going to have to get our energy from the Middle East. We'll be sucked right back into it. So that's domestic policy is going to be a, a terrible economy. Then if I look at foreign policy, which is my wheelhouse, he's not standing up to China. He makes nice speeches, oh, we're going to get tough on China. But, he's, but all the stuff he's doing, I mean, my God, he was asked about the Uyghurs and the concentration camps in China, and Joe Biden said, well, we have to respect different cultural norms. Look, genocide is genocide. I don't care where they're doing it. It's not a cultural norm. It's genocide. So I think he has a very poor foreign policy. Um, Iran is going to be a mess. He'll rejoin the Iran nuclear deal. Iran will get nuclear weapons. It, it's just all across the board. I think it's going to be bad. So where does that leave us? I think by 2024, if, if, if conservatives and Republicans get our act together and coalesce around strong candidates in the congressional and Senate seats, I think we take back the House and the Senate in 2022. And I think in the White House. And, and if I could ramble on for another second. What nobody pays a darn bit of attention to is in the 2020 election, put the presidency aside, what happened in state after state, congressional district after congressional district, state house, state legislatures, Republicans won across the board and they ran on the Trump policies. And guess what? The new Republican Party is young, it's female, it's black, it's Hispanic, it's veterans, and those are the people who were flipping Democrat seats to Republicans. That's the real story of the 2020 election. True, true. So do you think basically Trumpian politics that's, has left a stamp on the Republican Party that they see that that's the success and that's where... Yeah, it's this is Trump's stay? Republican Party. You know, we'll see what the president says. He's speaking at CPAC on Sunday. So we'll see what he says about what his future plans are. I plan to have a conversation with him before he speaks. And I know a couple of others of us who are here at CPAC are going to talk to him and just give him a lay of the land and a sense of what's going on. But I sure hope that when he does speak, you know, I say this for all conservatives, all Republicans, don't get sucked into looking about the past. Whatever happened in 2020, it's done. And if we continue to look in the rearview mirror, we're not going to look forward. And forward is our story. That's a great tale to tell. And so I encourage everybody to look ahead. Win the House and the Senate in 2022, win the White House in 24, and win it on policies that ensure American peace and prosperity. How do you think, what do you think is the best way to go get those messages across? What I'm just thinking about, there was the uh, airstrike in you know, Syria yeah. um, on Thursday, and Biden was getting praised for the strike. The same sort of action that, you know, Trump was criticized for in 2017 for, you know, not getting congressional support beforehand. So is it, are the messages getting through to the American public if they're just... Through, filtered they, through a media who's not, who's a very biased media? Mm -hmm. Look, I was in the White House Situation Room the night that, that President Trump bombed the Syrian airfields for the chemical weapons that right, they were being the, used yes. against the Syrian people. And it was the right thing to do. President Trump made the right call. He did it legally. We talked to our congressional leadership, Republican and Democrat. He went in, he did the deed, got out. We're not sticking around to be sucked into a Middle East war. I mean, contrast that to what Biden's just done. He's got his back in the Middle East. He sent troops into Syria. He's now gotten a military engagement in Syria. Where does this all go? America has spent 20 years fighting foreign wars in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam before that, fighting wars in the third world, which we couldn't win, where it didn't matter if we won. These countries were not important to us. And I'm sick and tired of American blood and treasure, and particularly the lives of the American military, being squandered and sacrificed like that. I sure as heck hope Joe Biden does get us into another war. But right now, he's edging there. And do you think he's going to re-enter the Iran nuclear deal? Yeah, I do. He says he's going to re-enter the Iran nuclear deal. But the other thing is, that was a total fraud from the beginning. It was always sold by the Obama administration. So, oh, this is going to prevent nuclear weapons in the Middle East, kumbaya. It never did. It only put their Iran's nuclear program on pause for 10 years. Well, meanwhile, the clock's been ticking. If they re-enter the Iran nuclear deal the United States does on the original terms, Iran has nuclear weapons legally 
within a decade. And every other country in the Middle East, they're going to get nuclear weapons too. We have a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. That's the great Iran nuclear deal. It was a fraud and it now endangers our security. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're out of time. I think thank we do. I mean, I think a lot of hellfire and brimstone. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for <laughs> joining us today. Much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm here with Kash Patel. He's the former chief of staff for the Defense Department under the Trump administration. Kash, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So there's uh, some interesting things going on in the Defense Department recently. <laughs> Apparently, they need to root out the white supremacists. What's your view of that? I mean, I think for someone who's done two tours at the Defense Department, one under Obama and one under Trump, that statement is outrageously offensive to our men and women in uniform. You know, unfortunately, in an organization of 3.3 million people, you're going to have some people that squeak through the cracks that we need to get rid of. I agree with that. But to say that it is a rampant, widespread problem, I think, is just um, an inflammatory, um, incendiary way to portray our men and women in uniform, and we just don't need that. And Aren't they always on the lookout for potential <laughs> well, extremists? You nailed it. I mean, it's not like our, our military went to sleep and then all of a sudden said, okay, we, we let in all these extremists, now let's go root them out. I mean, if you listen to this current Secretary of Defense and his spokesperson, they admitted that they don't know that the problem exists or where it is or how to even identify it. They just put a label on it and then said, okay, we're going to order our commanders to go look for it. It's not really an instruction that you typically would expect for the Department of Defense to execute. And I'm sure the commanders there will take it in stride because they're in uniform, but they're probably questioning where this came from and why we're doing it. So is there a specific mandate for how to execute that, or are they just meant to go find it? I think yesterday or the day before was when they gave the stand-down order, and there's, well, they were instructed to find it. But I don't know the details on on how they're going to do that. And, and quite frankly, they don't know the details on how they're going to do that. So it'll be news to all of us when they issue their specific instructions on where to look or if there's an incident here or something like that. So, well, What do you think that does to morale in the forces to just have this sense that they're going to come, I guess, root through things? I don't know how they're going to talk to their friends, look at their social media. I don't know. What are they going to do? It obliterates morale. I mean, seriously, you know, you have a department that's a million people in uniform, a million in the reserves, and a million civilians. You know, that's the largest organization in the world. And these guys are career folks that have been there through multiple administrations, and they volunteered to sign up. It's no one forced them to go in and execute the mission of defense. And they have more important things to worry about from leadership than them being told that inside their ranks there's problems of racism. I'm an Indian American, first minority to serve as a chief of staff for the Defense Department. I never once uh, was on the receiving end of any sort of racist, offensive conduct in my entire tenure there. So, you know, you would think I would be the guy that white supremacists would target. Um, but it never came across my desk. I never even heard about other people being impacted by it. So where do you think this is really coming from then? It's the politicization of the Defense Department. You know, it's what they accuse myself and Secretary Miller of doing just because we were appointed by President Trump to our positions. And all we did was execute his agenda, which was ending wars, killing, ho killing uh, high value targets and bringing home hostages and beefing up our Defense Department as a whole. Now, if you disagree with the policy decision, that's one thing. But then to go ahead and just say we're politicizing it because we're carrying out Trump's agenda, I think is absurd. This is a perfect example of actual politicization because now you're talking about things that don't exist at our Defense Department and you're creating them. So. Uh, President Biden has sent troops back into Syria. What do you what do you think about the situation there? So Syria is a place that under President Trump, we've had the lowest number of troops ever in our history. And it's a really, really low number. It hasn't been made public yet. So I'm not sure what President Biden's actions are on its actual troop numbers. I do think there are times when we need to keep the Iranians in check and the Iranian militia groups in Iraq in check. And that involves taking actions in Syria. So. I no longer have access to the underlying intelligence, so I can only hope the career folks there are doing what they've always done, which is report up the chain of command to any threats to the homeland. And hopefully that's what they were responding to. Do you think there's much significance to the strikes in Syria this week? From what I read in the media, it sounded like they were, uh, the verbiage came out of the White House was they were shots across the bow, so sort of a prophylactic uh, measure. 
I think it was needed a while ago. As you know, we were attacked by the Iraqi militia groups, or Iranian militia groups in Iraq just a week or two ago, leading to injuries to U.S. soldiers and even a contractor being killed. So I don't think you can allow that as an American military to happen. So probably should have happened quicker and, you know, hopefully it brings the temperature down um, in that theater, but we'll have to wait and see. And what do you think about uh, what Biden foreign policy is going to look like in the Middle East or what are you concerned about there or hopeful about? Yeah, I mean, initially they're already talking about reducing our assistance to one of our greatest allies, the Saudis, in the Middle East. They've already pulled um, a number of assistance that they, we were giving to the Saudis on their southern border with the Yemen war. That's a problem because, as you know, Iran's main proxy group, the Houthis, are in Yemen and operational. Al Qaeda is there and ISIS is there. Another step they took, which I disagreed with, was they, the Houthis, who are Iran's, you know, basically fighting regiment in uh, Yemen, we listed as a foreign terrorist organization because that's what they are, and that comes with implications. They get sanctioned. Global people can't trade with them and things like that. The Biden administration just delisted them. So they're no longer a foreign terrorist organization. I don't know how you can say that for an organization that's responsible for killing Americans um, and, and our men and women in uniform. Was there an explanation given with that delisting? Not that I've seen. Um, I think somebody somebody wrote about humanitarian aid being difficult to get in there, and I, that's a total red herring. We provide humanitarian aid in um, camps in Syria. That's a total war zone. It's totally doable. The United Nations does the same thing. We do it with our allies and partners. We've been providing humanitarian aid in Yemen, and we can continue to do so. So I don't disagree, I, I disagree with that justification if, if that's actually what it was. So what do you think should be the top foreign policy priorities from your point of view? I mean, those I don't think change. Normally, to me, a guy who came into national defense under Obama, it's always protect the homeland. You know, that's the, that's the ultimate principle that we drive our national defense on. But protecting the homeland, you're going to have to go out and root out al-Qaeda like we did. You're going to go have to kill ISIS like we did. You're going to have to bring our hostages home. And we brought 53 of them home under President Trump. And you're going to have to stay true to our friends and allies in places like Saudi and the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And hopefully we will, but um, it looks like we're going in the other direction. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. There's more from CPAC coming up after the break, but first, here's a special edition of America Q&A. The system does not measure a person by the color of their skin or by their ethnicity or their uh, religious creed. And it's the most compassionate system we know because if a person works hard, they're always gonna get ahead. I've learned that because I was poor once. 74 million people cannot be crazy at one time unless, you know, I'm, you see us walking around with little with foil hats on? I don't. That we're not that much different than them, and I think that we're more inclusive than you think. Uh, what you've been told about conservatives uh, on CNN and the other uh, mass market democratic media is false. And in fact, we're the only ones left that are defending the constitutional form of government and your basic freedoms. A way, um, it's important to have that we discuss through our differences. And we will find that uh, we're less different than we may think. Conservatism is about the, the freedoms that we have based on going back to the Constitution. If you disagree with me, look at the Constitution. You don't like it? Please, by all means, create a movement to create a constitutional amendment. So I'm here with Dave Bratt. He's a former congressman from Virginia and the current dean of the School of Business at Liberty University. Dave, thanks for joining us. You bet. Great to be with you. So let's talk about Africa. Yeah, Because <laughs> I know that's one of yes. your priorities at yes. Liberty. Is that right? Yeah. So especially from a business school perspective yeah. and based on your experience, what is the... Um, What's the strategy there? What do you think America needs to do with respect to Africa? Yeah, well, I, I kind of started out kind of a standard free trader. Trade is good, can't go wrong. Uh, China, you know, back 20 years ago, I probably would have been there. And then the China story comes up, and then there's books like Unrestricted Warfare come out in 99, and they declare their intentions on paper. And then we continue in the hope that things, you know, as they democratize, the next generation is going to become, you know, a politically more democratic, respect human rights, et cetera. That's not really happening. 
and it looks like they're aggressive, and it looks like uh, they're uh, linked with kind of the global uh, global elite uh, picture, kind of the, the kind of the Trump part of the Republican Party is at, at war with that, right? The establishment versus the American people. And so uh, we had a big uh, China conference last year and learned a lot, brought a lot of leaders and best authors in the country together. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, the Davos themes came up, et cetera, and everything China's been doing, uh, stealing intellectual property and uh, just an aggressive stance toward us uh, with 5G, et cetera, and Huawei. And uh, so that it, it, uh, I, now I'm, I'm at Liberty University, and I, I got a history. I used to work at the World Bank in the poverty section and the education. And uh, Africa now, it, China is in Africa also in all negative ways. And it just seems to me like, you know, our, kind of our shared Judeo-Christian tradition across with Africa. We have a lot of African friends in the faith, the missionary history, uh, friends in Africa. And so I've been reaching out to heads of states, ambassadors, uh, United Nations, uh, contacts, World Bank uh, development experts. And a lot of U.S. businesses are taking a serious look at Africa. People said, you know, 30 years ago they took a look in China and said, hey, there's a lot of economic growth opportunities here. And now I think people are giving Africa a good look and want to give Africa a good look. And uh, we've been, uh, the U.S. has been kind of absent from Africa for about 20 years. And Africans don't mind that. They're kind of the sick of the top-down charity philanthropy case. And they want a direct uh, business investment relationship. They, they want to bypass governments. Uh, I think they have some good new leaders uh, in 2018, 19. Uh, there's some, some significant turnover uh, and folks that have the capacity to really do some good business stuff. And in my view, the more friends you got around the world, the better. So that's what we're just trying to make friends and, uh, and uh, do some business together. So, I mean, China's been into Africa in a big way, mostly in yeah. a way these huge loans right. for infrastructure right. projects that yeah. they can't yeah. repay. So what's the status of that relationship right now? Yeah, well, I've been hearing from fairly high levels in Africa, they, uh, the heads of states do not like it. They don't like this top down. And then, you know, China's bringing their own labor with them, et cetera. When they default, they get the asset that uh, that's not good. It's, it reminds them of bad history. And that's not a true friendship. And so I, I think they're just looking to do business, not not even the NGO kind of thing, right? Where charities or nonprofits come in and build a dam. They want sustainable businesses, right? So water utilities, for example, we got a guy who's set in 13 countries in Africa coming to this summit at, that, that we're having at Liberty. And he runs water utilities. I think it's three cents a day. The Africans pay for it uh, through the cell phone technology that's available. And uh, if a well breaks in the old days, uh, you, you paid 25 grand and it's out of luck. But if you got a utility company, you got a revenue stream, you have to go fix the pipes. It's business, it keeps making money. And uh, the Africans, just like in the United States, uh, we're all the same. Uh, we just want to uh, own things and run businesses and have, have that security that we are a part of something. So what, what's the African debt situation? Are they still indebted to China? Is, is that dynamic still going on? I know there yeah. were a lot of loans there in the past that's trickled yeah. down a bit in the last couple of years. Yeah. But. Yeah, no, there, there's there's a debt problem on these huge pieces that we're talking about, kind of reminiscent of kind of World Bank structural adjustment, huge dams, huge mm -hmm. this. And there you had the world coming together to help somewhat. China doesn't have any benevolent uh, ideals in mind there. They're, it's just pure business and power. And so they're looking for alternatives there. And then beyond that, I, there, there's some very smart people I'm working with that have a love for Africa. They've been working for decades on these issues. And they think there's some currency issues uh, ahead for Africa too. They'd love to form an alternative uh, currency platform to Davos, et cetera, to the global elites. And uh, so we'll see what's possible. So I know the new head of the WTO is from Nigeria. Yep. I don't know if you know much about him, but do you, what do you think about having an African head of the WTO? Will that work out? Oh. Will that Africa's benefit, yeah. I guess? Yeah, oh, I think it's great. Uh, Nigeria, they have a, one of the Africa's richest businessmen that's uh, widely respected around the whole continent. And uh, I think you know, I think it's good for the youth, too, to, ha to have people like that to look up to. It's not just political leaders. It's people that are making stuff. And he, uh, I've seen... Uh, Nagoti on, uh, on films talking about his businesses. He had in-depth, uh, detailed knowledge of plants he runs, how many you know turbines and this, and he's describing it in detail. And I think that's a great thing for the young people of Africa to see, 
and to idolize that, that, that productive spirit. And yeah. so I'm, I'm positive on it. So what do you know of the Biden administration's uh, yeah. attitude or posture to Africa? Are they interested in more investment or what do you think? Well, by the transitive property of equality, not good. A to B, B to C, C to A. Uh, Biden on day one uh, is getting rid of Trump executive orders, uh, allowing China to be in on our electrical grid, just for example. Right. And we, we know in the past, everything China, China does is kind of data acquisition minded. And so we're letting them in the middle of, you know, building, you know, energy converter, 20 foot huge pieces of capital equipment that have sophisticated technology in the middle of our electrical grid. What could go wrong? Right. Everything. Right. And so, every, right. And, and that, that, you know, that's just one. And then you can just go down the pike. And then it, the, the, the bigger problem is our big businesses are selling the country out, right? The, the average person isn't being represented. Our, our big businesses just want to make money in the short run. And if it gives China in the long run a strategic advantage, who cares? I'm making money now. And I think that's the root of the problem. And so all that is a you know, kind of a bank shot to Africa. Uh, it's all related, right? The, 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 the bigger and the stronger China gets, they're a threat they're, you know, to, to the global order of things, and especially to human rights. We covered that last year with the Uyghurs. I think people know that part now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not good. They've shown their intentions. Uh, we have a global pandemic. I taught ethics for 20 years. I don't think the American people can psychologically deal with the idea that China caused it, right? So beyond the you know bioweapons <clears throat> issue, we'll get to that eventually, right? But I, I don't think the the average American mind is kind of a good person, right? I don't think they can psychologically handle the idea that someone has either maliciously or through neglect, but intentionally. Either way, it's an intentional harm of a global pandemic inflicted. Uh, that's been designed in certain ways. And Dr. Yang, last year we had her at the at the uh, China conference. She's she thinks we're the most gullible, stupid people in the world. She's like, it was made in a bio weapons lab. Are you guys, you know, totally naive or just, you know? And she's a PhD smart person. So it's like, I, okay, I, I'm listening to you, doctor. Well, and now China's also coming out with vaccine diplomacy. Yeah. They've got you know the cheaper yeah. vaccines right. and wow. going Shocker. into Africa with right. those. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, I. that story will come out after the fact again, after the profits have been made, right? And the big pharma, and we're going to find out all that story later. We always find it out later, yeah. after the money's in the bank. 08, the whole global order blew up. No one went to jail. The rich got richer, the poor got poorer. So that's the recurring cycle. Yeah, an accountability problem. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it, it does begin to feel that way after yeah. a while. Oh, it is that way. I, I and I think, I mean, now the, the nation split and the, the trick will be now, I think even some on the left, I've, I've seen a few liberals coming out speaking out against some of the stuff that's going on in this country uh, when it comes to repression of free speech and, and free thought. And so that's the hope, right? Hopefully some Trump triggered some people, some of those folks maybe now start taking a look out the window and going, I don't, I don't like this. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you always. You guys do a great show. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. And I've got with me Senator James Langford from Oklahoma. Senator, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be with you. So I know you're concerned about some of Biden's picks for the cabinet. Um, he was presented as a moderate, and uh, perhaps some of his picks are going a little further left than you would like to see. Yeah. What are your concerns? Yeah, his, his picks are definitely farther left than I'd like to see on it. I, I don't think he ever was a moderate. I think he's moderate in tone and was moderate compared to how far left some of the others were, like Bernie Sanders and others uh, that were running. But he's always been a liberal, and he's been an activist in that way, and has always been pushing. He was even proud in his time when he was in the White House that he said he pushed President Obama farther left on some issues. Uh, so I think, I think he's governing who he really is in that sense. Some of his nominees, like Neera Tandon uh, for the Office of Management and Budget, he came out, uh, Biden came out his very first day in office, met with his staff and said, if any of you talk demeaning to anyone, I'll fire you on the spot. Well, then he hires or tries to hire Neera Tandon, who has made a lifestyle about attacking people day after day after day after day. And I go, okay, that, that's just not consistent with what you said, quote unquote, you were going to do. Uh, when you get somebody like Javier Becerra, Javier Becerra is an attorney, and I understand a good attorney in that sense, 
has no healthcare experience, and in the middle of a pandemic, he's hiring him to lead Health and Human Services with no health background at all. So you ask the question, why is he hiring an attorney to run a health issue? The only reason is he has been very adamant about abortion, has been a very pro-abortion leader in California and when he was in the House of Representatives. So you have to assume that's the qualification that he really brings as someone who's very passionate and outspoken on the abortion issue. I don't think it's where the vast majority of Americans are, especially where he is. He's for partial birth abortion. He wants to put up posters in pro-life clinics uh, saying that they have to also provide abortion options and demonstrate that. Why, why would you compel someone to that? So th there are lots of issues that I look at. So whether it's interior and some of the issues about energy policy or whether it's health and human services or whether it's office of management and budget, there's just a lot of concerns that are there. So do you think there's going to be any buyer's remorse from the last you know, far left voters? Uh, th there'll be a mix on this. Uh, there are a lot of folks that uh, I always laugh when they say Republicans aren't united on an issue. And I always laugh and go, Democrats aren't either uh, united on issues. We as Americans don't agree on everything. Even within political parties, we don't agree on everything. But yeah, there'll be some folks that immediately step up and say, Biden's not pushing hard enough for, or he's he's gone too far from. So we'll just have to see that in the days ahead. I think Americans are gonna look at the policies over the next two years and go, that's not what I thought I was buying. And I, I think there'll be a pretty big swing that'll start coming back the other direction. And do you think um, this is going to help the Republicans in terms of you know the difference being that much more stark? Yeah, I, I think it will help us politically, but ultimately it's about the country, not about a political party, if I can just be flippant to be able to say that as well. And I understand I'm in a political party and I want to be able to see this set of ideas to be able to thrive, like what we're talking about today. We're talking about the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. We strongly believe in the right to speech. The left is focusing as much as they can on how do I limit speech? How do I limit access to the press that I don't like so you only hear the stuff that I want you to hear? How can I manage your religion and so you don't get too religious or do go too far Stray from what the center is. How can I manage your Second Amendment rights? That, that's where the left is on this. The, the right side, we're trying to be able to focus on how can people live their values and live their liberty uh, that we have as Americans. So I, I think that's ultimately where Americans are. So it's not just as much of where do we, how does this benefit as a party? I think if, if Americans get a taste of socialism and of government control, I don't think they'll like the flavor. And I think they'll come back and say, uh, no, I don't like that. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today. You bet, glad to be able to do it. I'm here with Representative Daryl Issa from California. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me on, and, and thanks for covering so much of what's going on here at CPAC. This, this is such an annual get-together of conservative thought uh, that it's so important that we get here that I just flew down from Washington. And uh, it's a bit smaller event this year and a lot more masks around. I know that uh, yesterday, you've got your mask. Okay, good, good, well done, my, my, mine's here too. It's a placebo because I've had my two shots and in fact, I am not only virus free, but I'm immune. So why the mask? Because currently this is a mandate that needs to go away for people who have their shots. What we really need to have is a, you know, a little wrist tag that substantiates that we've had our two shots, that we're 95% plus unable to get or give the virus and in fact begin to come out of our shell. This is something that I'm sure Governor DeSantis would be thrilled to do. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Dr. Fauci and the rest of the Biden team uh, are doing just the opposite. You know, the President of the United States is now in his third month since he became immune to this disease, but he still wears the mask for show. Do you think it's all for a show or modeling for the nation? What do you think? Well, there's a lot of debate, including Dr. Fauci, who first says you shouldn't have it, then says you should, now says you should have two. But leaving aside the, the efficacy of the mask, if in fact you've had your chickenpox vaccine, your smallpox vaccine, all these other things, you go about your life normally after that. It, it's sort of amazing that in California and many other places in the United States, our teachers who are getting first in line for the vaccine are saying they still won't come back to work. Well, that's exactly the kind of not following the science that they've always accused the other side of. And now, quite candidly, they're using it for political purposes. So in California, there's obviously a recall um, measure against uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. Do you think um, 
enough Californians are sort of seeing through the hypocrisy, certainly in his case, where he you know, went out when everyone else was locked in? Well, you know, we've only qualified one other recall. Uh, there have been a number of attempts over the years, and they normally don't even get all the signatures. In this case, they have more than enough signatures, over 1.7 million signatures, and still getting them. And two weeks from now, they'll begin the process of auth fully authenticating them. And our expectation is sometime in the late summer, the governor will be recalled. And the process is one in which, as long as the governor gets 50 plus percent for the recall, which currently in the polls show he has, uh, then 10 days later, later, there's a replacement. And that is in the same vote, right? I it's mean, in the same, same, same vote, ballot, same time. Ballot. Uh, and it's one of the things that people don't understand is that he's running only against his own record and currently there's a, a less than 40% approval of how he's handling a lot of things, including our economy. So what are the main issues with the economy in California right now? What are the main grievances? Well, first of all, we're, we're in the 44th, 45th in the rollout of the vaccine. There was over two and a half million doses in California that he hasn't bothered to get into people's arms. Uh, it's just inept. But there's also issues uh, of management that are just uh, more local, like lights going out all over the state because he can't seem to allow the utilities to produce enough energy. He's so interested in his Green New Deal that even when they don't have enough power as the sun goes down, he won't allow them to turn on backup generators, natural gas generators, or build them for that matter. But we also have uh, a couple of more, more recent ones. 11 plus billion dollars, estimated to be as much as 35 billion dollars, was paid out by our unemployment system to felons and other people who were gaming the system. And when it was discovered, what he did was he shut down the lawful people getting their unemployment. So you doubled up, not only had, was, was, was this fraud not uncovered in a timely fashion, but he's now punishing people who are unemployed and need those checks. Uh, just as he told everyone uh, to shut down their shops, wear their masks, and then he went to a $40,000 dinner at the French Laundry, didn't wear his mask, sat there with his other healthcare people, and laughed at us. Do you think the economic damage that has been caused in California, you know, during lockdown and, you know, companies are leaving, people are leaving, how permanent do you think those changes are? Well, you know, we're the golden state and gold doesn't tarnish. The problem is the luster, that, that, that sort of golden look is really gone. We're going to lose a congressional seat for the first time in our history. California has always been growing and growing faster than the rest of America. We've done just the opposite. We've had an exodus of people from California, and the exodus has been the most productive people. Uh, and the governor did nothing when Toyota and Nissan and other companies that pay very good wages left. He did nothing even when uh, Tesla dis was bidding uh, for expansion. He didn't compete, and as a result, all the new battery facilities and new production facilities for Tesla are gonna be made in other states. So what do you think Californians are gonna vote on most? Is it frustration with the lockdowns when it comes, you know, assuming that there is a recall ballot? You know, Californians are much more conservative than they get credit for. They've been pushed and pushed to a limit, and they now realize that the agenda of higher taxes and more regulation has begun really hurting them in the pocketbook. They said so in the last election when they voted in four additional Republicans to Congress, the first time in 20 years that we had a net increase. Uh, and they're saying it right now because the polls show almost a 10-point advantage to recalling the governor. That, that's a remarkable number. I hadn't seen the latest polls. Yeah, the, the governor's at 44% approval and dropping. And are there any front runners on the Republican side that are looking good to you? Well, you know, the recall is a very interesting sort of election because if you get 25% out of a 100-way race, you're the next governor. You don't have to get 51%. And there are a number of candidates, including uh, the former San Diego mayor, uh, Kevin Faulkner, 
who right now are polling over 25%, and people are just getting to know him. He was a very successful mayor, uh, came in and cleaned up a city that it was really in chaos, uh, lowered homeless, it's the only city, major city to actually lower the homeless count. Uh, and so he's a good candidate, but he won't be the only candidate. I expect that there will be dozens of candidates and at least four or five leading Republicans. And in the last recall, that's when Arnold Schwarzenegger won. So it could be a pretty high profile election. Arnold uh, was very high profile. <laughs> uh, and star power in, in a state like California matters. But remember, the, the governor, if recalled, can't be on the ballot. So we're not running against him. And, we're, and any Democrat that decides to get in is going to have to defend the failed policies of, of Gavin Newsom. And I don't think any of them want to do it. Well, it's a, it's a tricky position for the Democrats because by going on the ballot, they're also, it's a vote of non-confidence for Newsom. So it's a tricky one. 17 years ago, when Gray Davis was recalled, his lieutenant governor ran saying, vote for me and vote against the recall. Vote for me because I'm a good guy. And don't recall the governor because his policies are good. The lights were going off. People were leaving the state. Our, actually, our public utilities were in bankruptcy. Uh, people saw through that and voted them both down. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. You're most welcome. I'm here with Rich Valdez with an S, host of This Is America. Rich, welcome. Thank you, Cindy Druquier, NTD. I love you guys. You know I love the Epic Times. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be with you guys today. Excellent. So I hear you've got some new projects on the go. Um, maybe you can tell us about them. We try to stay busy, right? We do, uh, <laughs> just like you guys. Uh, keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on across America. And one of the new things that uh, I'm working on is the, the Libertad Agenda. Libertad is a Spanish word for liberty. And this is not new in the work that I do, but... It's new in the sense of a specific purpose. The Libertad Agenda is going to be a 501c4 organization that targets certain issues that are important to Hispanics and Latinos that are voters and bringing them a message. It's really about the messaging, in my opinion. Messaging that is pro-liberty, that supports the free markets, that supports free speech. These are, I think, under attack right now. And Hispanics, Latinos across America and in, in New York City, they need to know. So for people who aren't political in that community, what, what kind of messaging are you targeting them with? I want to use a message that really um, jibes with their lifestyle. You know, so people that are going to work and they're working hard, not just so they can make money, but because they want to take care of their families. Uh, family and faith are such a big part of uh, Latino culture. So I think that's a, a big part of it is, you know, you want to protect your family. You want to be able to protect your faith, your ability to practice your faith freely. All of that stuff is not necessarily under attack today, but we're on a slippery slope toward it. And we need to know about that at the very least. So are you, um, President Trump was able to bring in a lot of Latino voters into the Republican tent. Are these the same people that you're targeting or are they trying to get new voters to yeah, understand? Both and, right? So we want, we want to reach those and keep those. I mean, I was looking at, of all people, Chuck Todd, he mentions this gain that we see in blue collar, to NBC poll, blue collar Hispanic voters is a 13% increase over his last performance in uh, 2016. So you got to look at that and you think, wow, a double digit increase. You see very similar in the black community. So it, it shows you, this is not just people saying, oh my gosh, we love Mitch McConnell. We need to vote Republican. Of course not. These are people that, that are, they don't have to be enamored with Trump, but they definitely see the benefit and how it helps their situation. So speaking that language, Donald Trump said, and I think uh, remarkably, to African Americans, what do you have to lose? And he was widely criticized. Oh, how dare you? And now, look at CPAC. There are black Americans all over the place saying, you know what, I'm here for Trump. Trump brought me into conservative movement, and I'm here to stay. Do you feel like those voters were new voters, or they came over from being Democrat voters? Again, both and. I think some of them uh, might be new voters, and I think those are the most enthusiastic. Some of them were people that said, you know what, I voted Democrat forever. I'm going to give this a shot. Hey, it worked. But the rest of them, those are people that I think say, I don't care about politics. I'm an apolitical person. You got crooks on both sides of the aisle. I don't, get, I, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not going to get involved. But they did because I think they feel that, you know, this guy who's not a politician, this guy was able to really bring about a change that they could actually feel in their pocketbook. 
And so let me ask you a little bit about immigration, since that's one of the... Is that a big issue for the Latino community? I don't that's think it's now? a big issue for... Uh, I think the left purports it as a big issue and tries to use it uh, solely for Democrat voters to say, you know what, this is a huge issue. Because if you're a Hispanic, if you're a Latino, there's no way you could vote for that guy because he wants to put you in cages. But most people that are thinking say, nobody's putting me in any cage. And didn't Joe Biden and Barack Obama build those cages anyway? So I think people uh, are, are way more hip than people give them credit for. But that's what the left does. And I shared yesterday, and I'll just plug it real fast, a conversation I had with Jan Jekielek on American Thought Leaders. And it stayed with me. I could not shake it when he said, why do Hispanics lean left? And my answer was, while they do, the proof is in the pudding, you've seen it, they don't. If you talk to them, nobody, it, we love Che Guevara, nobody's saying that, <laughs> right? Nobody. So the question is, how does that happen? And the way it happens is by this constant barrage of information that's false, which hence Trump, your fake news. I love it. These simple one-liners that really changed the body politic in American politics. I think it's amazing. So how are you targeting these people with your campaign? So trying to have zone in on the media that they're already consuming. So if they're on Univision and Telemundo, until they cancel me and kick me off those airwaves, we're going to place ads uh, digitally, uh, cable, television, and um, targeting through social media. Because you want to get in front of people and at least give them the option to have some type of heterodoxical thinking. So you can say, hey, it's okay to think a different way. We can appreciate a different point of view. I think most people are willing to have a conversation as long as you're not saying, well, you're really bad because you, you have an orange hue and you have this big hair and we hate you. Th that's not an argument. That's not a defense. It's not an intellectual um, platform to really build a conversation. And I think people are willing to have that conversation if they have the chance. Are there conversations going on in the community about multiculturalism versus melting pot? How, 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 do, how is that seen? You know, I think both of those words get prostituted by different groups of people. I believe my dad's name is Juan. He came from Puerto Rico in 1955 and he decided to name me Richard, other, other children, John, Louis, Albert, um, John, uh, Bobby, Robert. So, you know, I think my dad didn't have an opinion on assimilation. I think he had an opinion on, if we were in Puerto Rico, maybe you would be Roberto, you would be Alberto. But we're here, we're in the Bronx, we're in Brooklyn at that time. And he said, you know what, we're gonna, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. And that's what he did. He didn't even go for middle names. So I think my dad was a common sense, blue collar guy, worked in a factory, and then became a doorman toward the end of his career in a, in a nice building in the east side of Manhattan. And I think, I look at him as an example, where I say, you know what, a political person was trying to eat and put food on the table. And he had the sense to do that because this is America. Excellent. Well, we've got to wrap up there and a good note to land on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy Drukier and NTD. And that's all for today's show. Thank you so much for watching The Nation Speaks. Be sure to join us every Saturday, 11 a.m. to noon Eastern. And from all of us here, have a great week.